Hey, this is Leif Ganford. I played the cash register thief in The Amazing Spider-Man, and you're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. Hey, this is Rich McDonald, and I play Commander David Mason on Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And you're listening to Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, I'm Simon Fisherbecker. You probably know me better as Dorian Moldavar from Doctor Who, or the Fat Friar from Harry Potter. And this is Everything Geek Podcast. Just hit the jackpot with the Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. I'm your host, Dory, and joining me are co hosts, Graham. Hello. And Maureen. Hi there. And also joining us today is a very special guest. We have actor John Leeson who voiced K-9 in Doctor Who and the Sarah Jane Adventures. So how are you doing today, John? I'm doing very well, thank you kindly. It's a pleasure to have you join us on the podcast. We're all big fans of K-9. Oh, dear. (laughs) Archive (laughs) material, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but it's great to have you join us, definitely. So getting right into the questions, my first question for you is, how did you decide you wanted to become an actor? Well, I think, quite honestly, I was an actor from childhood. I didn't have to make the decision to become an actor. Um, In fact, it, it seemed an absolutely natural course for me to take in later life. I was quite good at running away. That was my problem, running away from the realities of life as they were into possibly fantasy worlds, who knows. But um, eventually um, I had to harden up a little bit and so I uh, auditioned to join a a, a drama school, RADA as it happened to be, arguably the top one in the country, and (laughs) surprise, surprise, they accepted me as a student. And there I was for two years. Wonderful. That's very, very nice. My second question, which do you prefer, on-camera acting or voice acting? Oh, the answer is yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm being cheeky. Uh, voice <laughs> acting is something that, that sort of came um, as part and parcel of the sort of acting work I do. Most of my career has been visible um, theatre work all over the country, West End productions. Uh, I've spent three years in the West End playing different things in different plays. Um, Then a lot of um, sitcoms, BBC sitcoms in the 1970s and 80s, um, Dad's Army, Take Three Girls, um, My Wife Next Door, all sorts of things like that, which... uh, were quite interesting because you actually played before a studio audience, so there was still a little bit of theatre involved, and yet at the same time, down the lens of the studio cameras, you were also playing to the world at large, which was a a sort of bridge you had to cross. It was a hybrid 
situation to be in in a, in a strange sort of way. That's very interesting, yeah. And I actually did notice on your credits that you went to Adzami, which is very interesting because I've been a fan of that show for a long time and only realized when you initially agreed to be on the podcast. Like I looked up your full list of credits and I was like, wow, he was in an episode of Dad's Army. I don't know that. Well, no. You do. <laughs> yeah. Sons you learn something new every day. Sons of the Sea is the episode in question. And yes. you'll see me there. There's a lovely little story attached to that because I was called in initially to the makeup and hair department before we began shooting. And I was given, of course, as I was playing a, a, skull, a soldier, um, a squaddy, uh, I was given the number one army haircut, uh, which, was, which was quite fierce. You know, I had hardly any hair left. And I'd only recently been married. And I think my wife was a little bit um, alarmed that she'd got nothing to get hold of but there we are that, that that's another matter altogether however a fortnight later i was called in to get fitted for a costume and the costume included to my great disgust uh, a balaclava a woolly balaclava helmet a knitted balaclava helmet which meant that all you could see of my face excluded my hair nobody could have seen my hair anyway so the military haircut was quite unnecessary. So yeah, that, that is a bit ridiculous, but you have to, you know, cut your hair and you have, it turned really mad when the hair won't see it. That hey. is a bit, that is very interesting. I'm actually glad you told us that. That is one strange story, that's for sure. Yeah. So my first question is, how did you first get involved with Doctor Who? Well, this was an accident. <clears throat> it really was, um, because years back I had worked in repertory theatre all over the country, and there was one director I worked with particularly, a chap from Derek Goodwin. Very nice guy, lovely guy. And um, I met him entirely by accident uh, when I went down to my local pub just down the road from me. And who was there but Derek Goodwin? He said, oh, John, mate, lovely to see you. What are you doing? So I said, what are you doing here? I didn't expect to see you. And he said, well, I'm actually directing a Z Cars. It shows how long ago it was. I'm directing a Z Cars round here. Um, listen, listen, are you doing anything um, work-wise. So I said, well, no, I'm not at the moment. He said, well, stand by your phone because in a couple of weeks' time, maybe you'll hear something from the BBC. So I did. I waited. And the phone eventually rang from my agent. And my agent said, well, John, I've just heard the BBC want you to play not one, but two parts in Doctor Who. What do you think? So I thought, wow, my goodness me, this uh, meeting with Derek was wonderful. I, I, you know, I was quite astonished. He said, ah, but this is the thing. One of the parts is the voice of a virus. Tiny part, I thought. Tiny, tiny, minuscule part. You could hardly see it. And the other part is the voice of a Robot dog, what do you think? Uh, mind you, he said, I, it's only in for one storyline, so, um, you know, you, you just have to go with the flow, really, don't you? So I said, well, I'll take it on. And so I did. And here we are in 2014, and lo and behold, I'm still voicing K-9 from time to time. I've just done another big finish thing this very week. So there you are. That's very interesting. It's a very great story. My fourth question, what were some of your favourite episodes to work on for Doctor Who? Well, the best episode, well, I mean, the most in engaging episode I remember in the classic series was a story called The Sunmakers, which was written by Robert Holmes, a lovely writer. 
And The Sun Makers was basically a, a story that uh, took to pieces the, the tax system on one of the the planets that there had been. Obviously, um, um, Robert Holmes must have been having some tax problems himself. I don't know. I can't say, I can't speak for him, obviously. But uh, he was poking fun at the way people got taxed for things. And uh, it, it was a jolly, jolly story. And, and I enjoyed doing that very, very much indeed. It's very interesting. My final question for you, John, do you have any upcoming acting roles or other projects you'd like to talk about? Well, I'm, I'm, I haven't got any sort of visible acting roles to come, uh, as far as I know, unless any of your uh, listeners are uh, producers or directors and want to cast me in something. But I've got some more um, big finish stuff to do, and it's quite interesting nowadays because when I do big finish stuff, it's almost like whizzing back across the years, 30, 40 years, when I started working with Tom Baker and Louise Jameson and Lala Ward and people like that, uh, because we are still churning the stuff out. It is absolutely amazing. So I've got some more of that awaiting me uh, in, in the next week or two, which is lovely. Definitely, that sounds really great. So thank you very much, John, for answering all of my questions. I'll let my co-host Graham ask his. Yes, indeed. Graham. Hello. hello how are you? Um, sorry, you're going to be here for quite a while. <laughs> um, well, okay. uh, for starters, in uh, my opinion, K-9 has been stamped as one of the most iconic and memorable characters in Doctor Who. So how does it feel knowing that you'll be branded onto the franchise and that everyone will automatically know who you are pretty much till, uh, no pun intended, the end of time? Well, it's quite interesting because not everybody knows what I look like. No? I keep well, going... the weakest link thing, surely. <laughs> oh, yes, I know, I know. But uh, I keep going to these conventions and things, uh, Doctor Who conventions or, or sort of multifaceted conventions, and I will sit there and there'll be a big picture of K9 behind me, you know, and I'll be signing autographs. But when kids come by, they don't know me from Adam. Why should they're, they? They're just like expecting the robot dog to be at the table. <laughs> yeah. So I just do a little, uh, a, a tiny bit of the K9 voice, and you should see the expression on their faces. It is absolutely amazing. And that is a sort of reward that I simply can't put in the bank. That is just wonderful, absolutely mm. wonderful. So I, I feel, you know, very warm about all that. Yeah, well, as as you would be. I mean, uh, especially at conventions, you see the you see all the generations of those who've been watching the show in general, and like the awe of it all uh, as as one singularity. But um, do you have any favorite episode of Doctor Who, whether you were in it or not? Um, not particularly, because, I mean, I have to make a confession that I'm not, I mean, as, as a sort of rank-and-file, ordinary um, stand-up actor, I'm not actually a sci-fi fan as mm -hmm. such. You know, you, you will get cast, as I say, I got cast accidentally to play K-9, which was a wonderful thing to do, because you could go anywhere, do anything. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, no, I, d I don't think I have. I mean, any episode that comes up, uh, and if there's something positive that K-9 can be found doing in it, um, that, that's wonderful. I mean, w what sort of reward is that? It's fantastic. It really is. Course, yeah. um, like, uh, not, not, not every um, actor that works in sci-fi has to love sci-fi uh, in order to be part of it, surely. So, um, yeah, but um, do you have a particular uh, favourite line or moment that included your character? Or, like, not even in Doctor Who, but in any sort of work that you've done? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think with, um, with Doctor Who, I can't remember the storyline, but somebody made some silly comment to Doctor Who, to, to, uh, to, to K-9, rather, and um, I simply said, Your silliness is noted. <laughs> Which is quite I, think was, I think that was one of the classics, all right. Um, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure I remember the line in any way. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Um, but you have to remember that sometimes it posed problems for writers. 
writing for K-9, who hadn't had any experience of the character at all. And if K-9 was ever asked any direct question by the doctor or the assistant or whoever it happened to be, he would have to answer it directly. Um, and equally, he would probably answer it directly and then go into an extraordinary amount of explanation as, as, as behind the question, which often the, the occasion for, for the doctor or the assistant to say, oh, shut up, K-9, you know, which is quite a good idea because, you know, he, he's a great know-it-all. Mm. Uh, it's an ultimate yeah. know it all. I mean, it's a, it's 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 a robot dog. With a, I mean, once you once you give a dog a brain, like a, like a brain that enables him to speak, that kind of, kind of gives him an excuse. <laughs> well, it's not even a dog, you see. This is the mm. thing. He is absolutely a robot, mm. and uh, some writers made him more dog-like than others. And I would say, no, 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 no. Pull back from that because he is actually a robot. He At just the end of the day, yeah. incidentally to be dog-shaped. Mm. Well, um. Uh, in terms of your acting training, you um, went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, or as you mentioned, RADA, one of the best acting schools on the on the globe, in my opinion. Do you feel uh, like your professional training played a big part in where you are today? Well, I do. Um, it's interesting. I was talking to Louise Jameson the other day, and we were talking about classical training in a drama school and experience of working in the theatre in early days. And yes, indeed, uh, if you're playing Shakespeare and the classics, that equips you, as Louise rightly said, that would equip you to play in soap operas, in, in TV soaps and things like that. But if you had always, if you've gone into the profession playing simply TV soaps, that wouldn't equip you for playing the classics. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, you have to uh, have the experience of, of, of a classical background in order to fulfill all sorts of other things. I mean, that even applies to voice work. You know, it, th th there is a sort of trampoline on which you bounce as a voice actor. I'm not really a voice actor, I'm just an actor. But you, th that's a trampoline on which you bounce, and that gives you the size and the shape. Uh, and and, and the, you see, the, the, the thing about actors, the key to actors is their ability to listen, to be still, to actually be actively still. You think of some, some really great telly actors. Um, uh, um, I, I'm just thinking of um, John Thor, who played Morse, for example. Um, you know, being absolutely doing, apparently doing nothing, but thinking, being in character all the time, all the all the moments. You know, and that that is something that is instantly attractive. I remember too. Uh, that Tom Baker, with whom I worked originally as, as my doctor, he always used to say to the cameraman, how big am I in frame? How much of me are you seeing? How much can I afford to be extravagant in my gestures? Because if you're actually in mid-close-up or big close-up, you should, in fact, be doing pretty well nothing all the audience wants to see is what's going on behind your eyes, what you're thinking inside your head, how you're dealing with the situation that you're in. Technique. Well, uh, um, that was um, in-depth. Thank you very much. Uh, also, throughout your work, do you have any particular methods that uh, you use to get into character still to the day? If so, do you mind telling me a few of them? No, um, there aren't any. Um, I mean, as far as, as characters are concerned, you know, nowadays I just slip into playing K-9 relatively automatically. <laughs> it's almost like just like opening up a file and coming, oh, so it's K-9 today, just uh, oh, use, use that. Yeah, it, it, today it's uh, Thursday, so um, I've been asked to be K-9, so I am K-9. Here you yeah. are. Yeah, that's how it goes. But um, you are true to the to the script, and you're true to the character you play. 
you know, you play your line, whatever it is. You could be playing anything from Sherlock Holmes to a tramp in the street, you know, but whatever, you play your line. Of course, yeah. I, I have to say, you've been very, very interesting to talk to. The, that's uh, all my questions, so I'm going to pass you on to my good friend Maureen now, who has a few for you. Um, Maureen, right, what have you... <laughs> Um, so my first question is how did you decide on canine's distinctive voice well i was asked originally if um, i could provide a voice that sounded as if it came out of a tiny little transistor radio you know it's it i, I got all this information behind me a huge world of, of facts you know it's rather like the internet out, out of a tiny little elliptical speaker so um, I've just simply pitched the voice up a couple of octaves and made it sound very robotic. And that was the result, mistress. So there you go. <laughs> that's, that's... Originally, the uh, sound technicians, uh, when I was first doing it on the first story, The Invisible Enemy, uh, they, they tweaked my uh, voice track a little bit and made it sound a little bit tinnier than it actually was but then they realized that the actor was doing it for himself so <laughs> they took all their toys away <laughs> oh this is anytime i hear that voice it's kind of like it's definitely just the childhood just comes flooding back to you because i, I <laughs> it's such a great voice i think it's spectacular and um, so my second question is, did you know when you got the part how popular K-9 would be? No idea whatsoever. It was only in as for, for one story, as I say. And um, in fact, they kept the, the, the end of the story open during the course of the recordings because they thought, well, they've obviously spent quite a BBC had spent quite a bit of money in making the, the physical module of K-9. And they thought there might be some mileage in it. But I didn't know this. I'm always the last to know how K9 is going to be worked or, you know, whether he's going to be included in anything. Um, and so I was quite surprised at the end of the day to hear that K9 was, was going to have a continuing life. And uh, there we go. And here I am today. Ha uh ha. -huh. That's um, that's really cool. Um, echo. So, yeah, I just got an echo. My own voice is a bit strange. Quite um, right. So, right. Oh, you deserve it. I promise you. <laughs> my last question for you is: um, as a theatre trained actor, was there yeah. a difficult transition into the part of canine from, you know, theatre so physical and it's all about gesture and you're playing to an Projection. audience that can be quite far away oh. to suddenly being in a small booth with a I microphone. I think I've probably touched on this before. You know, you, you're actually conveying an inner truth. Um, now, on screen, yes, you're not working in real time as you are in the theatre. Uh, in the theatre, it's WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. But in film and television, it's what the editor, the film editor, uh, or the television editor chooses to let you see. So, um, in a sense, you are still within your character, but you know that you have to do less because you don't have to fill an auditorium. You know, you, you, are, you are as close to the audience as the camera lens is to you. Um, so you have to remember that as an actor, certainly. Does that answer your question? It does indeed. Um, I was just—I've always kind of wondered when I've seen, you know, big theatre actors go from theatre to screen. It's always been something in the back of my mind. So, um, thanks very much for answering my questions. I think Rory, we have a couple from the Facebook page that people want to ask. Yeah, we do have a couple of Facebook questions for you. Uh, from Gab, one of our other co-hosts who couldn't make it today. His first question is, seeing as you voiced K-9 since his first appearance, how did you feel when you heard that he'd be, you'd be reprising him again in the David Tennant episodes? Well, I was delighted, absolutely delighted. Um, 
It was tremendous because I didn't realize at the time that David himself was a great fan of canine. Um, uh, but of course, now you see me uh, or you see canine running around rather in, in the uh, school reunion story with David Tennant. But as far as I was concerned, I never met David Tennant until a convention quite some time later. Because I had pre-recorded the the canine voice in a sound studio somewhere. Because <laughs> as far as the BBC was concerned, that was a, a greater, cheap, cheaper option than actually having me uh, uh, attend the studios. Very interesting. I suppose you like you, you know, had to meet David at a later at a convention after that. I think that's pretty yep. interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. And his other question is, what other creature from Doctor Who would you have liked to voice? Well, I've re I have voiced various creatures. I've voiced uh, sort of Daleks uh, from time to time. Um, as far as Big Finish is concerned, I've, oh, yes, I've reprised the character of the... What is it? The, the the swarm, something to do with the swarm in in um, Invisible Enemy. The the nucleus. That's right. The nucleus of the swarm. I've done that. I've done all sorts of different voices, which I can probably not remember now. But uh, but there you go. And Big Finish is very very good to me because they allow me to play other characters as well. So uh, you know, I, I feel uh, fully functional as an actor working with them and of course working uh, purely as a voice actor with them uh, you know the, the the world is your oyster lobster no oyster <laughs> you can One go, or the other. <laughs> go, go anywhere do anything <laughs> yeah very nice so yeah that's all of our questions for you john it's been a pleasure talking to you on the podcast great stuff well, it's been very nice talking to you. So there we are. And good luck. Keep taking the tablets. <laughs> Thank you so much. So hopefully we'll talk to you again at some Who point. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Bye bye now. Bye. Now that was an interview. <laughs> yeah. <Hey nine. laughs> no, hey more. Moin, you just you tried to do his voice and it didn't work. That was great. That was actually me. That was no, actually from the TV show. It? it was no, from I the uh, I, when I swear I I swear I heard Maureen say something and then Graham add in as well. Like, no, that was just my overall joy of being able to interview Kano. Oh. Well I thought it hey, sounded no. like you were trying to imitate him. No. Anyway, yeah. Of course not. <laughs> So yeah, make sure to check out our YouTube channels. The podcast is www.youtube.com slash user slash everythinggeekcast. Mine is www.youtube.com slash user slash Septus Destroyers. Mine is www.youtube.com slash user slash Lizzie 11. Check out Graham's fan fictions, www.wattpad.com slash user slash Graham Kavner. Check out John Leeson's credits on IMDb www.imdb.com slash name slash nm 0498770 and check out channel 1138 broadcast live from so geeks out everyone geeks out geek out